Welcome to China Manufacturing Decoded from Sophieast, the podcast where we take you through some of the major topics facing importers and manufacturers in China today. Hello, listener. Thanks for joining us for episode 34 of the podcast. This is Adrian from Sophieast, and I'm going to be joined by our CEO Renault in what is the final podcast episode of 2020. So today we're looking back at 2020 and ahead to 2021, and examining the manufacturing landscape around the world. Specifically, how does this affect China, with so many companies from, say, America or other countries as well, choosing to diversify their supply chains away from China, move some operations and component suppliers out of China in order to escape tariffs, or indeed to mitigate the types of risk that they faced in early 2020 during the. Big shutdown of China's manufacturing during the coronavirus pandemic. So, is this trend of moving away from China going to continue? And what sort of countries are actually benefiting from this? For example, India and Vietnam. So, we'll have a bit of a look at that as well. If you are considering moving some of your supply chain out of China in 2021, this is a great podcast to round out the year with. Let's hear what Renault had to say. Hi Renaud, how's it going? Hey, not bad. How about you? Yeah, yeah, getting all ready for getting all ready for Christmas actually over here. Since、uh, we're recording on the seventeenth of December, so yeah, got、uh, got the tree up, got、uh, everything ready now. I think. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> as we as we come to the end of twenty twenty, I've seen quite a lot of articles, and one of the topics that's been quite popular is the. Moving of operations, either partly or completely, out of China to places like Vietnam, India, or other countries in Asia, or even Mexico. I've seen in 2021, and the U.S.-China trade war has been going on for quite some time now. And of course, we've also had the coronavirus pandemic to contend with. So. In today's episode, as we close out the year, I wanted to really get your point of view on the state of play when it comes to moving our manufacturing out of China and diversifying it by having operations in other countries, as well as China, or completely away from China. So, is it still a realistic trend that we see a lot of companies moving away from China? It is. A trend to plan for it. It is a trend to research the options, research, you know, what kind of suppliers we can find in other countries in Southeast Asia or South Asia. A lot of our clients have been asking us for these kind of things. So over the past year, we kind of beefed up our our presence in、uh, in in Vietnam and India for that. However.、Mm. You know, once you have a plan, even once you have identified some potential sources, there's a very big gap between what a relatively large company or a very large company can do versus what a relatively small company can do. And big companies, when they decide something, and usually these days it even comes from the, the board of directors, and you know. Thinking of how to mitigate the risk, how to be less involved with China, and they see that as a sort of an existential risk on on the on the company. Once it's decided, they will go ahead. They will move, especially you know for the products that they buy in in large quantity. When when they have a large operation, it's not that difficult for them actually to to make the move, because either they work through contract manufacturers. You know, Taiwanese, Koreans, often, and these contract manufacturers just tell them, "Oh, you really want to move over there? Okay, let's let us just set up a facility, right?" So they 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 make that leap relatively easy for the big company, and they 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 take care of all the logistics, let's say,、mm. and that's how a lot of companies have been have been moving, mostly assembly out of China. Now for Much smaller companies that buy, you know, hundred thousand or a million or ten million dollars a year. Well, it's much much harder. Usually, they need to rely on an ODM or OEM manufacturer. 
they don't control everything in their relationship. They have sort of a relatively complex um, setup, relatively complex agreement with these these uh, these these manufacturers that that give some weight to the manufacturer to actually decide, you know, what, what to do. Um, so it's it's often in part or, or woolly the, the, the manufacturer's product. So these companies in that case uh, have a very hard time moving to another place. I think I, mm. I said that before on this podcast, but you all, all these companies, especially the e-commerce companies and all the companies that do private labeling of products, if they go for, um, I don't know, they, they're looking for vacuum cleaners, let's say. Well, in China, they go to uh, the Canton Fair or Global Sources or, or whatnot, and they, they see they see some manufacturers that have, you know, 20 different models or 50 different models of vacuum cleaners. And they say, I like this one, do it in this color with this packaging with my brand. Well, how do they transfer that to Vietnam, to Thailand, to India, they have to find also a manufacturer there that has a wide range of products, uh, you know, and that will that will do the same thing. And that's not really existent there. Not maybe not yet, but at this point in time, it's not really existent. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> not to mention that um, they to to keep making the same product there. Number one, they're not really allowed to to do that because it's not their product in the first place. They're just distributing their manufacturer's product. Number two, even if they get around that, they would have to pay maybe for opening the molds to have the same enclosure, you know, the same shape, everything. They would have to to have, uh, you know, the whole development of the new product done somewhere uh, in, in, in Chennai or in uh, Da Nang or Ho Chi Minh City or, you know, who's going to finance that? especially the tooling, but not, not just the tooling, you know, the, the whole product. And these days, mm. vacuum cleaners are not very simple products. There's no. electronics in there. There's, you know, they have a number of functions and, and things like that. And it's, um, it's really not easy to move. Now, the companies that have designed and developed their own products are in a better shape here because they, um, they have the engineering files and everything. They, if they've done a good job of setting up the right agreements, they, they can move the molds and the, the, the various toolings uh, relatively easily outside of their supplier's uh, factory. Mm. But it still doesn't mean it's easy because then they, they might have to either redesign the whole product with a lot fewer Chinese components in there, or actually keep buying the same components from the same Chinese suppliers. And then what happens is that you, you still have your, uh, a good bunch of your supply chain in China, but then you're mm. assembling it in Bangkok. Well, if, if there's a problem with, Ch with China, you're still gonna fill it. And now you have a supply chain that's more spread out, that's longer, more complex, and more prone to disruptions actually. So what do you do? It, I mean, a lot of companies are facing this con conundrum, and it's it's not an easy mm. one. It's not an easy one. Vietnam, in particular, looking at uh, looking at one of the articles that I was talking about at the start of the episode, uh, which I'll leave a link to in the show notes. Since 2019, the amount of imports going into the USA alone from Vietnam has gone up by a, a, around almost 40 percent. So oh, yeah. it must be sure. it must be the case that it is actually now possible to not only have manufacturing done in Vietnam, mm -hmm. but also obtain components as well, surely. Um, <laughs> the first part of your, your, your sentence correct, but when it comes to the components, it's not that easy. So a lot of American companies said, you know, in 2018, 2019, they say, well, staying in China is too, too risky. We, mm. we need to do something outside of it. And maybe we, you know, we start to have 20% made outside of China and then we, we let that share go, go up and up and up. And for a lot of them, the easy choice was Vietnam mm. for many reasons. Um, a lot of Chinese suppliers, actually sometimes they're the same suppliers, have set up another factory in, um, 
you know, close to Hanoi or close to Ho Chi Minh City, and then it's very easy for them to to sort of move, but with the same supplier actually, right? Um, mm. In 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 other cases, it's it, you know, it's it's close to China. It's easy to get the components from say from from Dongguan to um, to Hanoi. It, the culture is relatively similar. The the ways of doing business may you know kind of look like you know relatively similar. It's not like going to uh, to India where there's a little bit more of a culture shock. Um, everything is really you know slower. You know, it seems a bit more difficult. Uh, Vietnam kind of looks a little bit more like China, so people are used to that. Yeah. And they like they like the similarity. Yeah. In actual fact, then, the sort of rush to Vietnam or perhaps to other neighboring Asian countries was almost a way to circumvent the uh, tariffs from the USA by having manufacturing done in Vietnam. But even though a lot of the supply chain is still Chinese. You can say that, yes. A lot of that is really just assembly and packing. In some cases, mm. the, just the last stages of assembly, mm. you know, the kind of flirting with the the, the, the rules here, um, in some cases, it's downright illegal. There's not sufficient value creation. But, you know, as long as they don't get caught, <laughs> they, uh, they just keep doing it most often. Yeah. And you, you're right. Now, in some cases, you know, there, there have been uh, companies owning manufacturing plants that actually closed them in China and relocated to Vietnam. It's not that many, but there, there have been some. And they kind of had to go back to the strategy they had in China 20, 25 years ago, which is a lot of vertical integration. Make, you know, okay, we don't just do assembly, testing, packing, whatever. No, no, no. Now we also need to do the plastic injection molding and we need to do the, the, the CNC machining and this and this and that because the, the network of suppliers, you know, of component suppliers is kind of missing in Vietnam. Um, mm. It's not really totally missing, but it's much, much less mature than in China. So to, to find the right ones that have, that still have the capacity for you and that are at the right quality level, the right price and everything is much harder, much harder in Vietnam than it is in, uh, in Dongguan or in Ningbo. And, and certainly in India, then I, I would I would assume. Uh, yes, same thing. Yes, yes. We've seen a number of contract manufacturers, Taiwanese contract manufacturers in electronics, uh, make the move for Chennai. Um, mm. Chennai is on the coast, on the east, sort of southeast of of, of India, and the. There was already some automotive production, so some car production there. So you have, you know, sort of a network of, of um, suppliers for, for metal parts and plastic parts and things like that, and educated workforce, you know, that, that get trained in that automotive industry. And then you, you, you have sort of a boom in electronic industry over there, um, but still a lot of components come from China. And by the way, that's that's pretty painful these days because uh, with the little I don't know what to call that the Cold War really between India and China, the Indian customs are really not keen on having a lot of imports from China. And what 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 that means is if if you were buying you know batteries and touch screens and PCBs from uh, from suppliers in Shenzhen and and shipping them to Chennai in India, well. You know the, the the custom procedures were you know used to be maybe a few days max, and now they might be you know three weeks, <laughs> from what I heard, two two or three weeks, um, mm. and and it might get worse soon, and that shows the the risk that is inherent to long and complex supply chains as I mentioned before, because the 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 longer your supply chain you know the the more um, links, or, you know, that, that that can be affected and that that can break. And here, mm. people thought that they were escaping the Chinese risk, but actually, they, they still source from China anyway. So if something wrong, really bad goes into China, and and the factories there are unable to make anything, they are affected anyway. 
Plus now they have to manage the relationship between China and India, which is an extra risk, right? So now are they going around the US tariffs? Yeah, okay, good job, you know, but you know, do you, do you actually, do you wanna move uh, some key stages of your supply chain and, and increase your risks? just to, to, to avoid these tariffs. You know, maybe when you add up all the costs, it doesn't make much difference actually for them um, mm. in, the, in the current situation. About India as well, I did read that India actually isn't a member of all of the same trading block or groups in Asia as, uh, as lots of the Asian countries, which means that they actually don't benefit from, uh, from very, very good tariffs when it does come mm. to bringing in you know, uh, components and things from from other places in Asia, which is another issue, uh, I suppose, when you're dealing with India. It might. I'm not really sure about that. It never came as a real issue in the cases okay. that we looked at. It it might contribute, you know, as a real cost factor, but I I, I didn't see that. Um, the cases were worked on actually. Okay. Now I've mentioned the U.S. China trade war. You know a little bit and and of course that is one of the big drivers of some high profile companies like apple uh moving some operations out of china to places like vietnam which they've actually done recently they, they're opening a big factory mm-hmm. ready to come online in i think early 2021 yeah. um in Foxconn, northern yeah, yeah that's is, right is opening um a big factory um just about i don't know one or two hours away from from the border uh, of of China, uh, relatively close to Hanoi, and why is that? You know, there's still plenty of workforce there, even though mm. salaries have been going up a lot <laughs> for people who used to uh, to do some other kinds of jobs and now do uh, do, do operator work or supervisor work in um, electronic assembly plants. And so, uh, a key question here is where are the components going to come from? And in the short term, I'm pretty sure it's going to come from China, mostly, right? Um, At least the ones that were currently (laughs) sourced in China. Now, Foxconn makes a lot of components, and that's that's the way they make money. They don't really make money on assembly. So uh, I'm sure they have a plan for moving some of that fabrication of components over mm. to, to Vietnam and to India and to other places and to sort of hollow out their, their operations in China. Well, mm. the, I, I don't know. I'm not privy to any details on that deal, so I can't really comment. Uh, as soon as I saw that article, actually, I was I thought, oh, that's that's northern Vietnam. It's near the Chinese mm-hmm. border. That's got to be because by necessity, they're getting components over the border from China. So, yeah, yeah it sounds like you're, you're you're spot on with that. And uh, as I was saying, uh, I've mentioned the U.S.-China trade war. If we continue on that vein a little bit, we need to mention the change in presidency at this point. So do you have any thoughts on how a Biden presidency might actually affect things moving forward? Mm. Well, I was talking about that with with a friend recently. And, you know, the fact that Trump was in a way, you know, uh, you might say innovative or you might say that he was ruthless or whatever you might say, what he's done so far is part of the arsenal of the, the, the next president. And mm. I don't see Biden just saying, okay, guys, you know, let's just erase that, forget it, you know, let's go back. Um, it, it would be seen as a sign that he's too soft on China and that would really not be the, the kind of message that uh, the US public opinion wants to see at that point in time from from uh, everything I read. So I don't think it's gonna go back to the, the previous situation. Now, is it, you know, the question is more, yeah, so the tariffs are probably not going anywhere in, in, in the short and maybe also in the midterm. Mm. What is it going to, to work on? Is it going to, to, um, to try to get more concession, more changes from Beijing. 
Um, or is it just going to let the Congress do their their stuff? I mean, the, the U.S. Congress has been doing a lot of things against China, actually more, you know, trying to do more things than, than Trump. Trump kind of followed them, actually, more than he led them in um, a little war against China. Um, I think Congress is going to keep going, especially against Chinese tech and Chinese um, sort of influence over mm. the, the, the U.S. society and, and, and their interests. I'm not sure the trade war is going to be at the forefront. And that's not bad news, you know, for, for our clients who don't like risks, who don't like things con- constantly changing with the risk of, you know, boom, 25% tariff. Oh, now we're losing money on everything we sell. You know, this right. is just not, not something they like to, to see. I don't think the trade war is going to be at the center of all, all of this. I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to focus more on, um, you know, intellectual property rights, um, protection, and, and, you know, stop uh, hacking into this and that and, and stop stop trying to influence these institutions and stop, you know, I, I think that's going to be the focus. Yes. And I, I think that's spilled over to the UK to an extent as well, because mm. uh, up to now we were going ahead with Huawei infrastructure um, in, in mm. the in the 5G rollout in the UK. And then surprise, surprise, as we come to Brexit and the government here wants to get a nice trade deal with the US, then we end up kicking out Huawei and uh, mm. Well, I'm not sure who we're going to use. It wouldn't surprise me if it's uh, American technology, but uh, I'm wondering whether that might be perhaps through some sort of um, light suggestion from the states saying, you know, hey, if you're going to be friends with us, you can't be having Huawei building your infrastructure. Well, I I don't think what U.S. company would be. (laughs) I mean, I don't want to tease them too much, but uh, they're very, very, very far behind on, on, on 5G. So, yes, not just the, the, the UK, but think of Australia, think of Canada. Yeah. And think also of some other European countries. Who knows? Yes, it's a, it's a it's certainly a strange time. You did mention the trade war perhaps will start to take a bit of a back seat. And there are other things that the states might want to focus on when it comes to maybe combating Chinese influence. What I did read recently, though, was that despite the effects of the trade war pushing down imports from China into the States by quite a a large percentage, I think maybe around 20% overall, in 2020, because of the coronavirus pandemic, this is you know, kind of all disappeared and it's and, and the and the imports from China to the US and of course other places I'm sure are now sort of booming, uh, presumably because of all the online shopping people have been doing. So have you have you seen any of this, uh, any evidence of this? Well there's a lot of a lot of sectors are, are benefiting. Mm. If you if you are a Chinese manufacturer of electronic bikes or bikes or gym equipment or kitchenware, you know, or office equipment, Mm. your life is good these days. There's a lot more demand than before. (laughs) And it's not just in China. I mean, we were talking with um, companies that were trying to, to, to have Taiwanese bike manufacturers take on their project and then Taiwanese bike manufacturers these days, they say, oh, sorry, sorry, we're very, very full. We can't get any new customers, you know, really too full, right? And that's the case with some some um, companies in mainland China also. They, they are quite full. Uh, they, they do, they, you know, they're killing it. They're doing a great year. And yes, the, the, I mean, look at all the congestion of the ports these days and, you know, all, all the mess with shipping. It's not only due to a, a very poor management of where the containers are and and um, you know some people also mentioned that some of the ships get scrapped uh, and, and and things like that uh, you know th- th- there's also the other part of the equation is demand there's more 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 demand for a lot of big stuff you know I mean mm. a lot of furniture and, and gym equipment and this stuff is big right yeah electronics also are, are not doing bad. So obviously some, some sectors are, 
are not doing great. Anything around travel, you know, the luggage industry is not doing great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, apparel is not really doing great because a lot of people get their um, the spring season of last year completely, you know, <laughs> uh, unsold. So they don't mm. have much cash. <laughs> it's it's terrible. So they, they they're not buying it. They're, they're going to try to resell the same thing that that they were hoping to sell last year. I mean this current year. Um, so th there's a lot of losers and a lot of winners here. Um, Overall, yeah, there's a lot of high volume products that are, that are getting shipped and, and, mm. um, and there's much less capacity for air freight because a lot of commercial airplanes, you know, they, they were carrying passengers plus some cargo uh, are not flying these days. So yes, it's, it's, it's a hit on the, on the supply side of, uh, of, of freight, of course. But it, mm. it might also come from a higher demand for um, for for sea shipment of, of high volume products. Mm. But it it seems that you know now that we're coming to the end of this, is it is it fair to say terrible year that uh, China really is coming out of it as as perhaps one of the winners? Whereas in the West over here, you know, we mm. continue to struggle along with bad economy, people, you know, still having a lot of trouble with the coronavirus, unfortunately, a lot of uncertainty. And uh, over in China, I, I guess they'll be thinking, well, do you know what, we've ha we've handled this pretty well. And even our economy and manufacturing sector is, is doing well these days. Yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah, there are people kind of unhappy about that. Yes. Well, yeah, I'm sure they are. I, I don't think I feel unhappy. I kind of look at it a bit enviously from uh, from over here in the UK. But uh, but yeah, mm -hmm. I, I totally understand what you mean. I've I've mentioned the US a lot, but when it comes to other countries as well, do you see them trying to diversify their supply chains? out of China, I don't mean countries, I mean companies in those countries, European countries, yes. Australia, wherever. Mm -hmm. Are they are they trying to diversify for different reasons than the US? Because of of course the US China yes. trade war is is quite specific mm -hmm. to the States. But so so what other reasons are you seeing for this now? Well first a company might be in Sydney, Australia, but mm -hmm. might be selling half of their products in the US and then the tariff supply. So the tariffs are actually forcing a lot of companies also outside of the U.S. to rethink their supply chain, obviously, because, you know, if they sell in the U.S. and they're hit with the tariffs, they're going to want to, to, to make their products somewhere else or at least, you know, a part of their products somewhere else. The, the, the other reason is everybody was really shocked uh, last, you know, uh, early this year in, in, uh, in February and March, mm. you know, what? My, my Chinese factory is closed and they don't know when they're going to reopen. Well, you, you know, that, you know, a lot of people thought about that and said, mm, we can't keep making that in China alone, you know. And maybe they had one supplier in, in Xiamen and one, one supplier in Hangzhou, but it's, it's all China and certain things impact, you know, all of China. So yeah. they said, we, we, we've got to, to get out of that. Of, of, of China, maybe not get out, but mm. you know, put one foot out, outside of China, so that right. uh, I was saying um, our ability to keep supplying products to our market is not impacted, and that makes a lot mm. of sense. Mm. Now, have they moved? Uh, you know, as I said at, at the start of this episode, it's not that easy uh, for a lot of small and mid-sized companies. Some of them definitely can do it. However, when you cannot fly to visit the potential suppliers, <laughs> you know, are, are you gonna just do Zoom calls and and you know not be able to really visit the factories with your own eyes and and feel the people there and observe and get your own opinion? A lot of people have just shelved their plans for now and they say, well. When I can travel, then this is going to be back on the agenda. Right now, mm. it's on hold. We have a lot of clients like that <clears throat> in this situation. Right. And I know a lot of companies in this case, they have projects for moving some of the manufacturing, uh, maybe moving their own factory 
Um, but, you know, things are on hold because it's really not that easy to move around these days. So they've, they've been waiting. And yes, China is, is benefiting from the status quo. Uh, but what's going to happen once all of these travel restrictions are lifted? I, I, I you know, if people are really out of cash, you know, I mean, companies, these companies that want to move, they're out of cash, it's kind of tough, and they, they just get by, you know, because the, their market is not doing great, then there's not going to be a lot of changes. However, mm-hmm. if they're doing good and they have some cash and they, they can uh, they can go ahead with, with these kinds of projects, well, you can expect a lot of, uh, a lot of things, you know, getting transferred out of China, yes. So that's probably going to be in the next sort of two or three years then, I suppose. Right, that's what mm. I would expect, yes. Um, yeah. okay. There's one more complicating factor, of course, is do they sell in China? Now, if they sell in China, mm. they want to keep selling more and more in China. They, they're not going to move all out of China. They're going to um, always keep some production in China, very probably, because importing you know, stuff into China and getting with the, uh, dealing with the Chinese customs and all the delays that it creates and the uncertainty and so on is not fun. <laughs> it's not fun. Yes, that's a that's a good point. And and also, I suppose as well, if if you are a business who is already selling a lot of your own products into China, do you want to risk the you know the wrath of the Chinese by moving operations out? Would would you potentially be penalised like that as well? Right. There is there is a risk. This is very very sensitive. Mm. If you have a consumer brand and you show that you are moving your your um, you know your manufacturing outside of China, you there might be a backlash. That's correct. Um, or maybe even the Chinese government might 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 get pissed. Who knows, right? Mm. So yes, that that's a very sensitive issue for them. Good points there about moving out of China or perhaps staying in China and uh, looking at places like Vietnam and India, where, of course, are, are some key locations for Southeast or, or indeed elsewhere in, in 2021. And as we close out this year, this will be the last podcast of uh, 2020 and we'll be taking a little bit of a break for Christmas and we'll be back with everybody in early January. So until then, Renaud, thanks for joining me. Well, um, thanks, Adrian, and thanks to all the listeners. And again, uh, keep us motivated. If you are listening on iTunes or Stitcher or some other similar app, go in there and just give us a, you know, a five-star review. Uh, that always helps us uh, yeah. keep motivated and, and keep churning these podcasts. Any comments on, on topics that you'd like to hear from as well? We, we'd love Definitely. to hear those and we can tackle those in 2021 for you too. In the meantime, <laughs> yeah, let's wish everybody happy holidays. That's and, right. Uh, yeah, we'll be back in January. Excellent. Thanks, Renaud. Merry Christmas and Merry Christmas to all the listeners. All right. Thanks. Same to you. Thanks for joining us. If you've enjoyed today's podcast, don't forget to like and share. And you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all other places that you get your podcasts from. See you next time.